We have entered a very busy time of year. Just a little over a week ago, we celebrated Halloween. Last Sunday, we celebrated All Saints Sunday here in our sanctuary. As my wife and I were driving back home after worship, our neighborhood put up all of their Christmas lights. I thought I had completely missed Thanksgiving. (laughs) There is so much going on, it can be hard to keep track of it all at times. And tomorrow is another holiday in the life of our country. I do want to take just a moment to say a word of thanks to our veterans. And I'd like to invite those who have served or are a part of our armed forces just to stand for a moment so we can thank you. Thank you all. Sometimes we can feel like there's so much going on in the life of faith that it's hard to keep track of it all. About a month ago, I think it was, Dr. Jennifer shared with me a video clip. I think it was the son of Andy Stanley, uh, who is uh, somewhat of a comedian. And it was some of his stand-up that this clip was showing. And one of the things he said is, you know, he, he thought his dad, Andy Stanley, had a hard job as a pastor because his job consisted of giving a book report every Sunday on the same book. <laughs> and I know many of you have read that book many times. And you've attended church for many years and Sunday school and Bible studies and some of Dr. Jennifer's studies. And sometimes it just seems like there's so much that we want to ask, what's the point of it all? How would you sum it up? In the winter semester of 1899 to 1900, Over 600 students and faculty members gathered in the main lecture hall of Berlin University. They gathered once a week for 16 weeks at 6 o'clock in the morning to hear a guy by the name of Adolf von Harnack lecture And Harnack in his day was probably the best known, most respected theologian in the church. He titled those lectures, The Essence of Christianity. And I'm sure many people crowded that lecture hall just because they wanted to keep up with what Harnack was saying. But I think most people were there because of the subject matter, the essence of Christianity. And here was a guy who wrote a multi-volume history of Christian doctrine. He wrote many studies on the early Christian church. He became an expert in the formation of the Christian Bible. He was gifted in languages and had studied in several other languages. He wanted to learn more about the Orthodox Church, so he learned Russian so he could go study in Russia for a while. And he was going to stand up and say, this is the essence of it all. After the last lecture, one of his friends who had been in attendance came up to Harnack and said, you know, you really should publish your lecture notes. And Harnack said, that's not possible because I was speaking extemporaneously. Thankfully, there was someone in attendance for all those lectures who was gifted in shorthand and had taken copious notes of each session. And from those shorthand notes, Harnack was able to publish a book. It was quickly translated into over 14 different languages, and it appeared in English with the title, What is Christianity? I think many of us, at times, 
would like to know how to sum it all up. What is the essence of our faith? Harnack in his lectures says repeatedly that he's trying to get at the kernel of Christianity. What is at the heart of it all? Harnack's book is good. He was a gifted scholar and a gifted writer, and it reads wonderful even in translation, though I think he's wrong on some points, in my humble and correct opinion. <laughs> but more importantly than the contents of his book, I would recommend to you a little scene that is found in the Gospels where one day someone actually came up to Jesus and asked that question. What's the point of it all? And I think we should take the response that Jesus gives and write it on note cards and stick it all over our house and our cars or wherever we have to put it so that it becomes just ingrained in our memory and starts to seep out in our life. The story, we're going to read it from the Gospel of Mark today. It's found in Mark chapter 12, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 28. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have said, what you have said is good. He is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Jesus finally makes it to Jerusalem. He became famous in his hometown region of Galilee, preaching and teaching and healing people, performing miracles. He became so famous that it was hard for him at times to enter the villages and towns of Galilee because people would see him and just flock into his presence. His fame spread beyond Galilee. Word of his ministry reached down into Jerusalem where the religious leaders were gathered, the people who were the ones overseeing the faith in those days. Occasionally, they would send representatives up to Galilee to spy out what Jesus was doing, to try and get a handle on what he was up to. And now Jesus comes to Jerusalem. And he's in the region of the temple teaching. And while he's teaching different groups within the leadership of the Jewish faith come to ask Jesus questions. At the end of chapter 11, the first group is the priest and the scribes and the elders. They come to Jesus and ask him by what authority he is doing and saying the things he's doing. 
Jesus responds to their question with a question. And when they will not answer his question, he says, neither am I going to answer yours. And they just go off pretty frustrated. Later, two groups uh, send representatives together to Jesus. They are the Pharisees and the Herodians. We know a lot about the Pharisees in the New Testament. They are people who want the most to keep their distance from the Romans. They are the ones who are most upset with the tax collectors, those that they view as collaborating with the, the Roman Empire. We don't know a lot about this group called the Herodians, but from their name, we assume that they are people who supported King Herod and his descendants in their policies. Part of what we know about Herod was he was put in power by the Romans. He supported getting along with the Roman Empire. So these are two political groups on opposite sides of the aisle, and they come to Jesus and ask him a loaded political question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And this is where Jesus gives his famous response, render under Caesar the thing that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. And both groups leave exasperated because they don't understand that any better than we do. <laughs> Finally, the Sadducees come to Jesus. And they're not going to ask about his authority or about his politics. They want to try and trick him up on doctrine. So they present this preposterous situation to try and ridicule a doctrine that they don't accept, one that they don't teach, one that they believe is not founded in the Jewish faith. It's the teaching of the resurrection. And after they pose their question to Jesus, Jesus politely says, you don't understand the faith or the scriptures. And they leave. So there's this trail of people coming to Jesus with some sort of controversial issue. At their best, they may be trying to figure out if Jesus is on their side. At their worst, they may be trying to ridicule or separate Jesus from their group. So we're almost unprepared for this scribe. In fact, when Mark introduces him, uh, if you've been following along in Mark's gospel, the scribes usually are not good friends of Jesus. This is the only scribe who appears in any way friendly towards Jesus' ministry in Mark's gospel. And he comes to Jesus and seems to ask a very genuine question. He recognizes Jesus as a teacher so he asks, which commandment is the greatest? Now the rabbis counted 613 commandments in the, the Torah. So which one would you put first? Or which one would you say helps interpret the others? Which one is the key to it all? What's the essence of it? And Jesus quotes a scripture that is so well known, so much a part of the faith of his day that it would be like standing up to recite John 3.16 or the Lord's Prayer. He says the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your strength and with all your body. That quote Jesus has taken from the book of Deuteronomy is what's known as the Shema in Judaism. The word Shema means hear. It's an imperative. Hear. That 
passage was the passage that is often put in little boxes on door frames in, Jew in Jewish homes and businesses. It's the passage that is often put in little leather boxes that you'll see Jews sometimes wrapping around their hands or their foreheads when they're at prayer. Because when Moses gives it to the Israelites, he says, I want you to talk about this. I want you to teach it to your children. I want you to write it on your heart and on your forehead and on your hands. I want you to put it on the doorpost of your house. I want it to be a, so much a part of who you are that it is just seeping out of you. And part of what that, that verse is trying to remind us is that when we talk about loving God, it's not just a mental assent. It's not just saying we understand that God exists and that God wants to be in relationship with us. It is something that moves our very life. It is something that is displayed in our actions. And so to make that plain, Jesus attaches to it another little verse. The way we can live that out, the way we can see that illustrated in our lives, if we truly have been captivated by the love of God and want to give our whole being in loving response to God, Jesus says, you will love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't create it. It's right there in the middle of one of the most boring books of the Bible. Leviticus chapter 19. Anybody here an expert on Leviticus? Do you know what's in Leviticus? Probably not, because it's some strange stuff. A lot of it is stuff that we no longer observe. It's about how to worship God in the tabernacle and in the temple. It's about when to bring your sacrifice, what sacrifice to bring, how old your sacrifice should be, what color your sacrifice should be. It has wonderful tidbits of information like what to do if you contract leprosy or your house contracts leprosy. I don't know how your house is ever going to contract leprosy, but if it does, you need to read Leviticus 15. It tells you how to get rid of it. And if it doesn't work the first time, you have to burn your house down. I don't know if there's insurance policies for leprosy in your house, but I'm just telling you, if you've skipped Leviticus, you need to be warned about that. And then in the midst of all that, there's this little gem that shines out of Leviticus 19. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And most of the chapter is just illustrations of what it means to love our neighbor in our daily life. It gets down into the details of our daily activities. He talks about those who own fields and vineyards not harvesting all of their crop but leaving some so that those who live in poverty and those who live as aliens or people from other countries in your midst are able to harvest also. It talks about not cheating or lying or defrauding your neighbor. It talks about not having two different systems of weight, one for those people you like and one for those people you maybe don't trust or don't like as much or who are different or not a part of your clan. Don't have two different forms of weight when you're bartering and selling with them. But have one system and treat each one justly. Love your neighbor as yourself. The great Harnack in his book, What is Christianity?, does talk about Jesus' emphasis on love of neighbor as key to his message and part of the essence of Christianity. 
What I think Harnack misses is he talks about it in such a way as if he believes it's just possible that once I say that, everybody's going to go out and do it. And part of what we learn in the New Testament, part of what we learn when we look at the full ministry of Jesus is that for that to really happen, there has to be a change of heart. That it's only really possible to love our neighbor if we have first learned how to love God with all that we are because God has reached out to love us with all that God is. And when we learn to see ourselves as children loved by God, then we can pour forth that love towards our neighbor, understanding that they too are God's beloved children. What a joy it was today to hear at the beginning of our service our kids singing, Jesus loves me. And then to hear our adult choir echo back, yes, He loves me. When they were singing that anthem, it reminded me of one of Harnack's students, a guy by the name of Carl Barth, who probably became the most well-known and respected theologian of the 20th century. Barth wrote a book on church dogmatics that is over 10,000 pages long, and he never finished it. But at the beginning of each volume, he went back to Jesus because he said, Jesus is at the center of our faith. Once while touring in the United States on a lecture tour, he was stopped as he got off a train in Chicago and a reporter asked him, Dr. Bart, you have written, I think by that point he had written 10 volumes of his church dogmatics. You you have written so much about the Christian faith. but how would you sum it up? And Bart thought for a minute. And he said, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Each of those words is extremely important for Karl Bart. But at the heart of it all, is understanding that God loves you. And when that captivates us in such a way that it takes possession of our heart, mind, soul, and body, it'll flow out in the way we love our neighbors. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your love reaching out and surrounding us, for making us new, for helping us to see that we are children loved by you. Give us the grace and strength to extend mercy and your peace and love to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.